Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 95 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Sue Dobson. Sue grew up in Pretoria, South Africa during the apartheid era and witnessed firsthand the brutality and oppression of the government at that time. As a young woman, she decided to take action and join the outlawed African National Congress to do her part to improve the lives of black South Africans. She was eventually sent to Moscow for nearly a year of training in surveillance, intelligence gathering, and weapons before returning to South Africa as a spy for the ANC. Once there, she lived a cover as an apolitical journalist while building relationships and reporting back to her handler in the ANC. In the end, her cover was blown and she barely escaped the country with her life. She's just recently written her memoir titled Burned, The Spy South Africa Never Caught. I invited Sue onto the podcast to discuss her life story and what spurred her to join the fight against apartheid and what it cost her to do so. And by the way, if you enjoy her story and want to learn more about it afterwards, you can download a free sample of her book Burned at the link in the show notes of this episode. But before we dive into the story, I want to say a big thank you to everyone listening who is also supporting me on Patreon, including Adrian R. and Dave E. Your monthly contributions there help me keep this podcast going week in and week out. As a way of thanking my patrons, I offer a lot of great freebies and promotions, including free and discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Patrons also get exclusive access to long-form articles of mine that aren't available anywhere else. If you haven't signed up for my Patreon yet, but you want to, just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to right now. Sue, thank you for taking the time to sit down with me today. Thank you for the invitation. Much appreciated. Absolutely. This is a subject I have to admit I did not know a whole lot about this time period and the, the politics and the violence in South Africa until I read your book. So it was very, very eye-opening for me, and I was really glad to have the opportunity to learn more about it from you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So all of this occurred in the 1980s, 1990s, around that time period. And is, your book is yeah. just now your book is just now coming out in 2023. So what led you to finally tell your story publicly now? I think it took a while for me to realize that it would actually be of interest to people. Initially, I was, I think, quite traumatized by what I'd been through. And I needed time to process it. And I felt that people perhaps wouldn't be interested in a white woman's story in what apparently seemed to be a struggle in, in South Africa. And with the fullness of time, I realized that I had every right to tell that story, that I was as South African as anybody else. And the whole point of our struggle was for us to be equal and to not be obsessed by race or definitions and that we needed to embrace diversity. And for that reason, I felt it was important for me to actually talk about that. And I felt that it was a drop in the ocean, perhaps of a struggle, but it was my drop and it was my contribution and it was as valuable as other people's contribution. Absolutely agree. And your your book was very, very interesting for me to read. So I am glad that you decided to put it out, not just because I wasn't aware of as much of that region and the politics of that era as I wanted to be, but also because you do have such a unique story and the way that your life kind of threaded the needle in, in a certain way between the various groups that were in, in conflict there so much. So can it you did. take us? A... Go ahead, Sue. So can you take us back to your childhood in the, I guess, the early to mid 1960s? Can you talk about what it was like at that time, not just for you and your family, but the politics and the race relations as a whole in South Africa then? Yes, of course. I was born in South Africa in 1962, and that was a time of 
apartheid, which was a legislation that actually legally separated the different races in the country on the grounds of ethnicity, on the grounds of race. And that meant that there were provisions made for different races. In other words, a great deal was spent on education for white people. White people had better medical care, better education, as opposed to people of colour who were discriminated against and had inferior versions of that. And all around me, there were signs of what we would call petty apartheid. There were two kind of apartheids, really. There was grand apartheid, which was the differentiation on the grounds of colour and things like education, health care, etc. And then there were the smaller things in society, which were possibly even as upsetting and as traumatising to the people involved, whereas there were benches reserved for white people and benches reserved for black people. There were entrances to buildings for different races. There were beaches, for instance, for white people and black people. There were buses and trains for black people and white people. And every aspect of our lives was touched by a policy that divided us and created a psychology of distrust and unease and uncertainty, really. And that was pretty much the atmosphere that I grew up in in the 1960s in South Africa, when apartheid was probably at its strongest and support for those policies was part of our life. We didn't go to schools that were integrated. I went to white schools. I saw a white doctor. I traveled on white public transport. I had no opportunity whatsoever to mix with South Africans of a different color. Hmm. Wow, that seems like a very, I guess with the benefit of, of hindsight, I, I think to myself, how could they have thought that they could keep that going forever? And of course, we know that it didn't now. But at the time, even in the 60s, was there a significant amount of racial conflict already, like violence and, and that sort of thing because yes. of apartheid? Or was it mostly being kept a lid on? Well, unfortunately, the history of my country is very much a history of oppression. And any efforts to object to those policies were usually met with great resistance by the authorities and often great cruelty. For instance, there was the Sharpeville uprising where the police fired live ammunition on peaceful protesters. And also later on in 1976, the Soweto uprising where school children protested against Afrikaans as the medium of instruction. So our history was a history of resistance to some extent. And eventually that resistance became organized in the form of the African National Congress. And at first their policy was one of peaceful resistance and trying to negotiate and to have discussion with the government of the time. But their approach fell on deaf ears. And later on with the support of outside elements, that struggle became an armed struggle. And the ANC later developed a military wing called Mkontowe Sizwe. And I eventually joined Mkontowe Sizwe as a military intelligence agent. But mm. as I was saying, our history was one of, of resistance and sometimes fierce resistance. Many South Africans were outraged at the discrimination that their fellow South Africans experienced. Black South Africans had to, for instance, carry a passbook that determined where they could go and where they could not go, where they could work. Families were divided. Husbands were sent away to work on the mines. And our history was a history of division and unhappiness. And eventually that took a form of greater resistance. So you mentioned when you were very young, you were riding on the white bus and going to the white school and, and that sort of thing. 
at what point in life did you become aware of this kind of like simmering pot of, of all the conflict that was going on and that was to come in the future as well? I mean, did you have like a kind of a blissfully ignorant childhood up to a certain point? Initially, I think my early childhood was a very innocent one and perhaps a very blessed one. I was very privileged in that I had good health care and the opportunities that white children had. I had good educational opportunities. I had the potential for a good future. And about the age, I'd say, probably about four or five, I was standing in a queue in a post office with my mother. And it dawned on me that the people in the queue next to us were darker skinned than we were. And that was my first awareness. And also that if there were children who were darker than me in my class at school, although they were classified white, there was some tension and some bigotry and some racism towards them. And that slowly became apparent as I got a little bit older. And that, of course, was the psychology of racism that was slowly permeating the classroom. And I think it's safe to say that we grew up with racism. It infused our existence from the cradle to the grave in that point. Hmm. That actually brings me perfectly to my next question for you, because I know that you are of English descent as opposed to Afrikaner. So how did that affect your own upbringing? Did the Afrikaners children and, and families look down on you or look at you differently in any way as you grew up? Most definitely. You know, my existence in South Africa was really a awareness of division on all sorts of levels. And there was a lot of tension between Afrikaner and English speaking communities at that time. And I came from a predominantly Afrikaans speaking town called Pretoria, which was also the seat of government and a very conservative place. And we had incidents, for instance, where Afrikaans children and English children would openly fight on school buses, for instance. There would be a lot of conflict, a lot of name-calling, a lot of racial insults where Afrikaans children would call us names that originated in the Boer War, which was many, many years ago. And we, unfortunately, would reciprocate. This tension sort of stayed with us throughout our our childhood into our, our teenage years and into adulthood, unfortunately. And there were a lot of divisions between communities. It was quite rare for English and Afrikaans people to be integrated at that point in time. Hmm. Oh, I didn't even realize that, honestly. So I, I know, as we mentioned just in the introduction and in your book, of course, you eventually went to Moscow, but that, that's years in the future. So can you tell me how you first became aware of like Russian activities, Russian presence, Russian culture, that sort of thing? Like what point did that come to your attention as you were growing up? Well, part of the propaganda, if you like, that was put out by the South African government was anti-communist propaganda and anti-socialist propaganda. And we were sort of bombarded with messages through the media, particularly the radio, and I used to listen to the radio as a child, which influenced me greatly, that the Russians were after South Africa, that they wanted South Africa because of its raw materials, its gold, its diamonds, that the Russians wanted to use the Cape Sea route, and that South Africa was a prize that the Russians desperately wanted. So I grew up not only with this sort of discomfort regarding other races and people who are different to myself, but also with a hatred, if you like, that had been inculcated by the media. But I was quite a rebellious child, and I think my curiosity was inflamed by this forbidden force that somehow lurked outside South Africa. And I was very curious about Russian history, Russian culture, and longed to go there. 
I wasn't at all frightened by the paranoia that seemed to be predominant at the time. Hmm. So how did you take steps in that direction? Was it just reading books or taking courses at high school or college or, or something like that? Like, how did you move towards we were, that world? We were taught Russian history at school. Bizarrely enough, we were taught about the Russian Revolution. And of course, the Bolsheviks and the communists were the, the baddies. And I think we were taught that probably to show us, you know, what we needed to be afraid of and that we needed to be watchful of any sort of socialist stirrings within our own communities. And I was very much influenced by what happened in 1976 in South Africa with the Soweto uprising, as I mentioned before, where school children protested against Afrikaans as the medium of instruction in schools and were met with violence by the police. Who, and they shot these children in cold blood. And I felt hugely moved by that and felt that these were children like me and we weren't very different the only difference between us was that i had a wealth of opportunities and a future of promise whereas these people had been denied that and these children were right fighting for the most basic right which was instruction in their own language and to have an education and I think that that struck a great chord with me. And at the time, the ANC had become more active in Southern Africa and had started to have training camps in some African countries. And after the uprising in Soweto, a lot of very disillusioned and angry school children were recruited by the ANC and taken into the camps for training to become ANC members. And in those camps, there were also the presence of Russian instructors, as the USSR at the time was very sympathetic towards liberation movements, particularly those in Southern Africa. And that's how there was a Russian connection in as to what happened after Soweto. OK, I see. And the ANC is the African National Congress. Was that organization already banned in South Africa at that point? Oh, yes, most definitely. We were not allowed to join the ANC in any shape or form. We were not allowed to have any ANC literature or to mix with anyone who was an ANC member. In fact, if you were an ANC member or an ANC sympathizer, you probably wouldn't be free to walk the streets, you would probably be sitting in prison somewhere. There was a massive clampdown and obviously there was a very powerful censorship about any material that came from the ANC, anything that was written by any of the ANC leaders or Mandela, who at that time was in prison, we were denied anything from hmm. the ANC. So how then were you able to actually make contact with them and, and volunteer to assist since it was such a, a an illegal organization and one that, you know, you would suffer a lot of consequences for becoming involved with? I've tried to become more active when I became a university student. And I was also fortunate in that I had family contacts who were ANC members and who are living in exile. And they were responsible for setting me up with a meeting with a senior member of the ANC in London in 1980. And that is how I first made my first approach to the ANC. I was very keen, I was very idealistic. I wanted to play a part in making a new South Africa, and I wanted desperately to be part of the ANC. Wow. Okay. And that led you to travel to London, you said? You had to leave the country? Yes, I did. There was no way of meeting anybody from the ANC in South Africa 
if you needed to meet someone or wanted to meet someone, it had to be done in a clandestine way. And I was very fortunate as that contact had been set up for me, but it had been set up in London. So I had to leave South Africa on the pretext of going abroad for a holiday. And during that period, I actually met Aziz Pahad of the African National Congress and spoke to him about the possibility of joining the movement or working for the movement. I know that was very dangerous for you, but were they also concerned that you might be some sort of infiltrator or or something like that, at least initially? Oh, extremely so. At the time, the ANC was full of informers, unfortunately, and he was, I think, quite cautious when he met me, and rightly so, especially somebody coming from South Africa and a white woman coming from South Africa, a a very young white woman, because at that time I must have been 18 or 19, and obviously quite naive and idealistic. And I think he wanted to give me a healthy dose of reality, really, and quite rightly so, I think he did. He taught me many important lessons during that visit. We'll be right back. Hello, nerds. Come listen to the History Nerds United podcast, and let's make history fun again. We interview today's best authors, whether they are established Pulitzer Prize winners or someone debuting their first book. Let us show you that history is not a boring class you took in high school, but a place where the best stories come from. And we don't just cover history. We also love to chat about true crime, biographies, memoirs, and so much more. So head on over to History Nerds United, and let us introduce you to your new favorite book and learn the story behind the story. History. So how long were you in London and what did you do after you returned home from there? Did it feel like a a brand new world to you at that point after your meetings? I was so excited to meet him and I really believed that he would somehow give me some guidance. He actually did give me guidance, but I didn't realize the importance of it at the time. It was only much later that I realized that those were actually words that were quite wise. He told me to go back to South Africa and to create a legend for myself, to create a way of living that would not arouse any suspicion by anybody, that I was to blend into white society, to pretend to be apolitical and ordinary and not to attract attention at all. And for me at the time, that seemed an almost impossible task to do because I was so fired up and and so enthusiastic and so desperate to actually join the struggle that it was perhaps sobering, but it taught me something so important and it stayed with me throughout my years and still is part of my life. Perhaps what is unseen that is the most important that one needs to blend into things and and to be quiet and to wait. And I think that that was the lesson he taught me. Wow. So you kind of essentially taught yourself a lot of the fundamental aspects of living this double life. You didn't get any instruction at the beginning. You were just told no, to do I it didn't. and prove yourself. That was the only instruction I was given. And it was very difficult for me because it meant that I had to distance myself from the student organizations that I would have liked to have joined. I was still a university student at that point, and I would have liked to have become involved in what seemed to be, you know, fledgling movements of opposing apartheid. I wanted to be part of the demonstrations and the the public declarations against it, but I realized that I couldn't be because the security police watched the student activities on campus, and I would only draw attention to myself. So you built a new life, like your career coming out of university, and all of it was specifically to fool people, essentially, at that time? Unfortunately, and perhaps fortunately, yes. (laughs) I had to be something that I wasn't, and I had to do it properly. I could not speak to friends or family about what I wanted to do. I couldn't share my true self with anybody. And it it was quite a lonely existence for a lot of the time. 
and it was a process of trial and error where I perhaps would would say something inadvertently and realize that I shouldn't have said it, that I should just rather keep quiet and be apolitical and not have opinions on what was happening in the country at the time. Hmm. Do you, since you mentioned trial and error, do you think you had any close calls where you caused anyone to think that you were hiding something or holding back on, on your own true feelings or was, did it just blow over eventually? It blew over. I think that I was probably quite apprehensive about it and probably more focused on it than I should have been. I was conscious of wanting to get it right. I was conscious of wanting to be disciplined and it is a discipline to live that way. One has to be completely disciplined and focused and aware of everything all the time. Yeah, it's it's hard to imagine. I mean, I, I talk about it a lot, I read about it a lot, but it is hard to imagine living every single day like that, especially when you don't yet have a mission and you haven't yet begun on the true purpose of why you're doing all of that. So how long did you do that and, and what kind of job did you take? What How did you live like that exactly without drawing any attention but still moving forward? I lived like that for several years and there were times when it was extremely difficult and extremely lonely. And I often felt that I had to struggle to keep my eye on the prize. And I had no real instruction. I had no handler. I had no one to, who was training me. It was a very, very lonely existence. But I did follow instructions. I took a job in journalism when I finished my degree. And I took a job with a particularly conservative newspaper called The Citizen and began working there as a reporter and blended in and sort of made very apolitical comments or very conservative comments. I dressed very conservatively and did my absolute best to blend in. It was a very good training round for me. Hmm. Amazing. And so you, you had to keep it up for several years, but at what point did you, well, should I say, did you pass a test or how, how did you become eligible for additional training with these Russian intelligence agents? Well, quite fortuitously, there was another trip to London that happened to be a sort of a, a little holiday almost. But we also, I rather, sought out another ANC contact through my connections. And this time I was more fortunate, perhaps. I met the wife of Ronnie Casrolls and Eleanor Casrolls was very interesting to speak to. I found I had a rapport with her and she set up a meeting with her husband, Ronnie Casrolls, who was a senior member of the ANC and who was also high up in military intelligence in Mkonto Eseswe. And I had an interview with Ronnie and he must have spotted some potential in me. And I was offered the prize. It seemed like a prize. I was offered the opportunity of military training in the USSR with a focus on intelligence work. And that after my training, I would be reintegrated into South Africa. And my brief was to work as closely as I could and to move in government circles and preferably be part of the government department, which is exactly what I managed to do. Hmm. So how did you feel when he offered that to you? Did it feel like exactly what you'd been working for? I mean, were you shocked that it ever happened at all? I was absolutely amazed. I felt that I had been given the greatest gift and it was something I had wanted for so long. And I felt I had worked so hard for it. And I think that he probably felt that I was disciplined enough and focused enough to go for that training in that I had already maintained a legend. I had already lived it for several years and that I understood the importance of holding my own counsel and behaving in a way that would not arouse suspicion in any way. Amazing. So how, how old were you at this point? Like early to mid-20s, I guess? Yes, I was probably mid-20s by then. 
And, you know, this is something that I had longed for since my teenage years, and it was something incredibly special for me. So how then did you make your way to Moscow, and how did you stay there without drawing any undue attention from work or family or anything like that? Well, I returned back to South Africa after meeting Ronnie and announced to everybody that I was going to go backpacking around Europe for a year. I was going to take a gap year and then I would settle down <clears throat> and I would think about my future and make decisions about what happened next. And at first my family were, were horrified and, you know, sort of quite concerned that I was going off to sort of strange places. And I said I wanted to go right through Europe and I wanted to enjoy myself for that year. What they didn't know is that I caught a flight to Moscow from Naples and began my training. And I was able to communicate with them through a series of postcards that were sent by Russian representatives in various Western countries. I would write the postcards and a official would take them and post them and those would reach home. So my family were under the impression that I was having a wonderful time in Europe. Wow, wow, very clever, very, very clever. It was. So tell me about your time in Moscow. It sounds quite fascinating from everything I've read. It was quite unbelievable. I had a, a thirst for knowledge. I had a thirst for the training. It was conducted by mostly military personnel who clearly had been trained initially by the KGB. A lot of them had seen active service in various countries like Syria or Afghanistan and had seen conflict, you know, in the, with the conflict with the Mujahideen at the time. And they were quite battle hardened, but absolutely charming, extremely well educated and excellent teachers. And I covered a variety of subjects, what we would call military combat work, which covers radio work, hand-to-hand -hand combat, explosives, weaponry, etc. But the focus for me was particularly intelligence work and gathering intelligence, surveillance, counter-surveillance, that sort of thing, because that's how I would be working. And I would be working in deep cover in South Africa eventually. So oh, all my training was focused on that. Hmm. So did they make it very clear to you during the training or, or perhaps before about what exactly they wanted you to do when they went back? They weren't simply equipping you with all of the tools and abilities that you might need in any situation? Well, very little was spoken about specifically because they were very, I think, respectful towards the understanding that I was an ANC recruit and it was up to the ANC to decide how they used me. But okay. it was up to them to provide me with the raw materials, if you like, and that was the knowledge and the, the techniques that I would be using. Hmm. I see. And since you mentioned that you got a lot of weapons training, although that wasn't the entire focus by any means, did you think that the ANC would use you for some sort of sabotage or assassination missions or anything like that? Or did they simply want you to be able to defend yourself if necessary? I think the focus was primarily on defending myself. I was treated, I think, with, with great respect in that I was unusual because I was a white woman and apparently there were not many white women that did the training. So I was treated perhaps a little differently. However, I was aware of the fact that the theater of war is a very fluid thing. And it, there may be a time where I would have to be called upon to use those weapons, or I would have to be called on to defend myself. Mm -hmm. And I had to be well equipped to do that. And I had to be in a position psychologically and emotionally where I was able to do that, that I was disciplined and focused enough and trained to a high standard and able to do so. 
Okay. Yeah. Very understandable there. So did you meet any other trainees, any fellow trainees while you were there, or were you kept separate from anyone else that might've been doing the same thing? I was kept absolutely separate. I never met another trainee at all. I was aware that there were groups of South Africans who were in Moscow who were also having training, but they were trained as a group. And there was a constant tension that we might run into each other on the streets of Moscow. I was there with my interpreter and my protector, if you like. And they, of course, would have their interpreter and protector as well. And there was some concern that we might sort of bump into each other one day. But I was kept in absolute isolation. The only people I saw were my instructors and the housekeepers who ran the apartment that I lived in. Hmm. And I did go out and about, but it was always with my translator, who was also okay, nice. there to defend me if need be. I see. So you were you were very well taken care of, but I take it you also didn't really have much liberty there. Would that be a good way of putting it? I think that I could have had if I wanted it, but I didn't really seek it out because I was in a, a strange city. I was on my own. I was a young woman on my own. And also my command of Russian at that time was very rudimentary. You know, it was the, the bare basics of conversational Russian. And also I enjoyed their company. I had a, a very lovely translator and companion called Igor. And we went to the opera, we went to the ballet, we went to museums. We had a very good time together. And I really did see a slice of Russian life that I really enjoyed and people were very kind to me and very warm to me. Hmm. So it was in many ways, a very enriching experience. I could tell you that really came through in the book. Did your, because you had studied Russian history and that sort of thing early on, did it meet your expectations or did, was there anything that surprised you once you actually spent time there? I think what touched me was the sadness of it all. It's a country that suffered greatly through history and also has a great humility about it. Now, you could argue that recent events in history have changed that and it might not appear to be so at the moment. But certainly my experience of it was that the people I came into contact with were deeply respectful of the sacrifice that had been made in what they call the Great Patriotic War, which is the Second World War, where they suffered enormous losses, for instance, in the siege of Leningrad. And Russian history is, is a history of, of suffering, you know, and, and there's, a, there's a sorrow and a tenderness about Russia that I will always carry with me. Hmm. Fascinating. Did you have a chance to ever go back again? I know we're fast forwarding a little bit, but after your time there, were you able to spend more time years down the road in Moscow again? No, but I would dearly love to. Oh, uh, I'm <laughs> sure things have changed enormously since I was there. I was there at a very specific time in Russian history. I was there during Perestroika and Glasnost, where Gorbachev was extremely popular and where there was a threat from Reagan for, from Star Wars, and that was very much in the, in the news at the time. And Russians, ordinary Russians, would demonstrate for peace in their lunch hour, which was something that I had never experienced before, and I hmm. found quite touching, really. I can imagine, I can imagine. So it must have been very bittersweet for you to leave, because I know that you knew you would never see those instructors again after you had shared so much with them over that period. It was heartbreaking for me. I had grown to care very deeply for them and it was very difficult to say goodbye. And also my instruction was that I was never to go back and I was never yeah. to seek contact with them again, which I never did. Hmm. So you have no idea at this point what happened to them, if they're retired now or, or anything like that at all? No, I, think I, I would dearly love to know what happened to hmm. them. I think by now they must have retired and perhaps some of them are quite elderly by now. Um, mm -hmm. 
I would dearly love to know what happened to them. That would be that would be fascinating. It'd be quite a reunion, I'm sure. I would did love they it. did they know you as Sue Dobson or by another name? Only my translator knew my true identity. Mm. And he met me at the airport and I was driven through the streets of Moscow and he said, What name do you want? And I said, Oh, I don't know. And he said, Well, you know, there's Lady Diana in the news at the moment, you know, she's going to marry Prince Charles. Why don't we call you Diana? So my Russian name was Diana <laughs> and everybody knew me as Diana. Oh, wow. Well, maybe one of them will see your book in a bookstore now or something like that. I mean, who knows? It'd be quite serendipitous. Be wonderful. Before we go on, I want to let you all know about a new educational tool you're not going to want to miss. It's the Gray Man Briefing Classified. By now, I think I know my listeners pretty well, and take it from me, this briefing is exactly the news and educational reference source that you've been looking for. You'll get breaking news updates from all over the world on topics including planned protests and riots, low-intensity conflicts, natural disaster alerts, cyber attacks, supply chain disruptions, and more. You'll also get access to articles that help you build your own skills, including urban survival, home security, counter-surveillance, escape and evasion techniques, and more. And this is much more than just a newsletter in your inbox. Joining the Gray Man Briefing Classified also includes invitation-only channels on the Telegram and Signal apps for convenient real-time updates. The newsletter subscription is normally $5 per month, but if you use the code GBC Spycraft, you can save 20% each month for the life of your subscription. I'm already a member myself and have been reading and learning a lot since I first subscribed. Look it up yourself at graymanbriefing.com. That's gray with an A, graymanbriefing.com and use the discount code GBC Spycraft to save 20% right from the start. So after you left Moscow, how did you come back and kind of reintegrate into South Africa with this new knowledge and this new mission and, and everything that had transpired? It was extremely difficult. I found that I, I longed for Russia. I longed for the people I had left behind. And I longed for the possibility and what I'd had, you know, to be myself. And it was very difficult for me to revert back to the legend and to be disciplined again and to be silent again and to hold everything that I knew deep within myself and just to wait, to wait for the right opportunities. Hmm. So the opportunity, would that be up to you or you were you waiting for a, a mission or for a signal of some sort before you began anything? Initially, I was waiting for a signal. I was waiting for an instruction, but the only instruction I had received had been when Ronnie had visited Moscow and he had said to me over a dinner with a few Russian generals that the best thing I could do was to get back into South Africa and to reintegrate myself into South African society and to try and find a position in a government department or even media, you know, get into a pro-government publication and just work your way to the top and wait and sit and okay. until the opportunities arose, really. I see. So because you had worked previously for the, the newspaper, The Citizen, did that allow you to leverage another job in media or journalism or something like it that? It certainly did, because by that time and before I'd left for the Soviet Union, I had worked for a few publications and I'd also worked in broadcasting. So I had quite a bit of experience. And at first, when I arrived back in, in South Africa, I got a job on a English speaking newspaper in Pretoria, the capital. And then very fortuitously, there was a position that came up in the publicity department and called the Bureau for Information which was basically a propaganda department run by the government to promote South Africa and South Africa's dealings in the rest of Southern Africa. And I was very fortunate. I went for an interview and I got a position on a new publication that they were bringing out called RSA Policy Review as an English writer and an English translator. Huh. Okay, so were you covering any anything political or was it small time stuff to begin with? Well, it was, to begin with, it was deadly boring. It was you know, a series of, of interviews with these excruciatingly 
boring government ministers, junior ministers who had absolutely nothing to say. And I thought, God, I'm never going to survive this. And eventually <laughs> the opportunity started to come and I was given the opportunity to interview the Minister of Foreign Affairs, somebody called Pick Boerta, who was a, a extremely unpleasant character, really. I slowly began to get more and more opportunities and I realized I needed to generate my own work. And at the time, there was a lot of work at the Bureau for Information going into the preparation for the independence of Namibia, which was known as Southwest Africa. And the Bureau was very involved in all sorts of rather dubious projects in Vintok, the capital of Namibia. And I was quite lucky in that I had a series of interviews that took me to Vintok and I became more and more involved with the process of Resolution 435 for the independence of Namibia. Hmm. Okay, so, and how did that turn into something that would be to the advantage of the ANC? Like, what was your role, or what did your role become in the independence of Namibia? Well, as I, I've I might have mentioned before, you know, the liberation movements of, of Southern Africa are, a lot of them were influenced and trained by the USSR. And a lot of them are sympathetic with each other. And the Southwest Africa People's Organization, or SWAPO, which was the liberation movement in South Africa, in Namibia rather, had a lot of contacts with the ANC. And there were a lot of similarities in the position that both movements found themselves in. And indeed, some SWAPO cadres were trained in the USSR. So I felt that there was a potential to actually do quite valuable work in Namibia. Not only was I observing what was going on in the lead, lead up to independence, where we in South Africa might be in a similar position one day when Nelson Mandela was released and we would be going for free and fair elections, as we were aiming for in Namibia, that would give me an idea of what was going on behind the scenes. And it was very clear to me that South Africa was trying to destabilize the election process in Namibia. They were backing a particular political party. I was recruited for what you would call a dirty tricks campaign, really, where we were sent to Vintok and we were encouraged to write anti-SWAPO copy and we were encouraged to promote the party of choice, which was the DTA that South Africa backed. Hmm. Okay, so if I understand correctly, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the government was hoping that this party would win the elections, and so Namibia would only be like an independent nation in, in name only, essentially, Absolutely. like they would still have a measure of control or influence there? Very much so. And, okay. you know, South Africa had a vested interest in Namibia. Namibia is very rich in all sorts of, of minerals and natural materials and mining. And South Africa had a vested interest and they were not very happy at the prospect of the United Nations becoming involved at the time. And they were certainly not in agreement with Resolution 435 introduced by the United Nations. And in fact, were quite put out that the United Nations presence was, was in Namibia at the time. So it was a, a very interesting time. It was a time of transition and a time of, of change. And the leader of SWAPO, Sam Najorma, was due to return to Namibia. So South Africa had really sort of stepped up the anti-SWAPO propaganda at the time. And I found myself caught up in this, which was actually very fortuitous because it meant that I could report to the ANC what exactly we were doing to destabilize those elections. Hmm. Okay, so you had just found yourself in the perfect position already. So Absolutely. what happened what happened once you started traveling to Namibia for these 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 trips that you were taking for the Bureau of Information? 
Well, one of the trips was quite, again, fortuitous in that it involved going up to the Northern Territories, Oshakati and Ondangwa, where the South African Defence Force was actually in the process of supposedly withdrawing from the area in preparation for the independence of Namibia and for implementing Resolution 435 for the independence of Namibia. And one of those trips, I ended up in the Northern Territories and I was introduced to a chief of police who handled the negotiations with the security forces and who was very much involved in the activities of the area. Okay, okay. So what happened from there then? Did you try to use him as a source of information? Well, it's, it all really happened quite, again, I've used the word a few times fortuitously. I think that this period in my life was governed by opportunities, really. I was fortunate in that opportunities presented themselves regularly. And sometimes I wasn't in a position to call for a meeting with Ronnie. I wasn't in a position to ask for guidance or advice because contact was so difficult to achieve and it could only be done outside South Africa. To my surprise, this person proved to be absolutely invaluable in the role that he played. He was aware of troop movements. He was aware of what was going on in that area, which actually undermined the movement towards Resolution 435 for independence. There was a lot going on that didn't quite make the press. You know, there was hmm. a lot of undercurrent, and I found that it was a place full of information that was hmm. incredibly valuable to us. Okay. And this, this person, was this Heston De Bruin, is That's that correct? Correct. De Bruin, yes. That's De Bruin. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about him? Well, he was quite a flamboyant character. And that's not his real name. We've had to change his name. But he was quite a flamboyant character, very interesting, and had had a history in the security police in South Africa. So I was aware of his history. And first of all, he shared it with me. And in addition to that, I was already aware of who he was in that he had been involved in working as a police informant. He had managed to infiltrate the student movement at one of the universities and had reported on several students, which had resulted in lots of arrests. And it had been quite damaging to the democratic movement for students at the time. And I found myself with this person who had this history and who was also in quite a, a powerful position in the area where he was fully aware of police activity and also the activities of the South African Defence Force. He was aware of the movement of SWAPO cadres across the border and also aware of how the South Africans were intercepting those insurgents and often killing them as they came across the border. Hmm. Wow. So he had a huge amount of information you needed. Was it difficult for you to get close to him and kind of elicit this information out of him? Well, it wasn't really. I suppose I let things develop and we became close. And I found that he confided in me and he spoke to me and we became got to the point where we had an intimate relationship, I suppose you would call it. And I found that he spoke very loosely to me, <laughs> which meant that I had information at my disposal. Hmm. So that that's kind of ironic because we know, of course, from your book and from your story that you were assisting the ANC, but he didn't know that, but at the same time, he did know you were a journalist, so I, or you were working for the Bureau of Information, so you would think that he would be a little bit more careful about what he revealed to someone who, whose whole job is to publicize information, but I guess that he thought that you were on the same side and he had nothing to worry about, huh? Do you know, 
I think so much of my success at that time was due to how I was, how I looked, how I seemed. I seemed so ordinary and I was this fluffy little blonde thing. And I don't think anybody really took me seriously, which worked in my favor, as, as you can understand. And I let that image continue because it, it served me well. You know, I was the dolly bird who was up there in the in the middle of the bush and everybody rushed to help me in and out of tanks and took me on rides in armored cars and introduced me to local chiefs and treated me like I was some sort of princess on some sort of tour mm -hmm. up on the on the border areas mm. and I suppose that's where that advice I had so many years ago came into its own where you have to blend in and if you're very ordinary and you very usual there's no reason for anyone to suspect you that is your greatest power your ordinariness if that makes sense. absolutely I agree completely and someone who is not taken seriously. That's the best kind of cover there Absolutely. there is, I would imagine. They thought I was a dumb blonde, you know, <laughs> and, and I was, you know, they, they, they opened car doors for me. They watched their language in front of me. They, they, you know, sort of treated me like I was made of glass and I wow. left them, wow. you know, I left them. I thought, fine, this is exactly what I want. Please go mm -hmm. ahead, do it. <laughs> My goodness. So getting close to Heston in that way, did you find that like, you know, personally revolting in any way? Or was it just something that you were able to do and needed to do, therefore, you know, to get the, the information that you needed? You know, I'm often asked that question. And the only thing I can say to that, and I say this in absolute honesty, is that the end justifies the means. Hmm. I was that focused and that disciplined that nothing else mattered to me. And wow. I was so caught up in the role of being the dolly bird and the confidant and the little bit on the side, you know, the little fluffy girl. I was so caught up in that, that all I could think of is what he was going to say next and what he was going to announce. That's all I could focus on. I hmm. put my feelings about it completely out of the picture. They did not come into it at all. I had to be hardened on that. Wow. I could not wow. allow myself to get involved emotionally at all. Interesting. It's good to hear you be so so candid about that, honestly, because that's not something that many people can or, or would say, I don't think. And, and I have to ask you, there's an absolutely fascinating part of the book, and it's in the prologue as well. But I know that despite this intimate relationship that you created with him, you came very close to killing him at one point, didn't you? Well, you know, as charming as he was, he was a Jekyll and Hyde character. And I've got to say that there were some occasions where some of the things I was told were that reprehensible that he's lucky he didn't get his head blown off. You know, <laughs> I, I felt very close to that on some occasions, but I was not an assassin and those were not my instructions and I was not going to do that. Well, so what was it that you did after that? I mean, if you, you, had, you were considering ending his life, but then you didn't and you had to move on, did you just have to kind of put a lid on that and and just forget about it or did you I had to put a else? lid on a lot of things <laughs> there were a lot of things that happened that I found very reprehensible morally reprehensible politically reprehensible things that made me question my own belief and my own integrity and what I was doing but I had to keep my eye on who I was, who I really was, and what I was doing. And that was difficult at times. It was very difficult. And I, I felt often that I was pushed to the edge. When you say pushed to the edge, how did that come out or how would it have come out 
anyway, like a some sort of breakdown or like a like a rage induced incident or or depression, something I, else? I suppose it would have come out in temper, which is where we you know, you mentioned that part in the book where he could have had his head blown off. But he wasn't. He didn't. He's, he lived another day. And that is, I think, where the discipline comes in, that I was able to pull back from that. I was able to keep a lid on it. I was practiced at keeping a lid on it. My feelings could not come to the surface. I could not allow myself to indulge in those. And I didn't. Hmm. So do you consider your time with him? Was it a, a success overall? Like you gained all the information that you needed or that he had to provide and passed it along? I think it was I think it was a success, but I pay, I did pay for it in that it was not a conventional thing that my handler would have agreed to me doing. But I was in the, a position so deep at that time that if I had withdrawn, I would have caused suspicion. Mm. And I was constantly aware of the fact that this was someone who was highly trained, who was very astute, who was very perceptive, who was very intelligent, and who was very charming and quite capable of eliminating me at any time. And I would have disappeared off the face of the earth and no one would have been the wiser. So I felt you, that I was constantly walking a very dangerous place. Yeah, you, you certainly were. Do you think he ever came close to suspecting you or, or anything like that? Or was he totally, had he let his guard down around you completely all the way up till the end? There were times where he was completely relaxed with me and spoke openly. And then there were times where he seemed quite moody and unpredictable. And those were the times that I found worrying. I was concerned that perhaps he was suspicious at that point. Mm. And also because I, I came and went, you know, I was I, I would go back to Pretoria to write up the copy, write up the stories, you know, make sure that the publication had the interviews that I'd been sent for. And then I would go back to Namibia. So because I wasn't there constantly, it was very difficult for me to keep an eye on how things were going, you know, and, and to get a feel for if things were going wrong was quite difficult to do hmm. but for the most part i think i managed to read him correctly okay so with all of this work that you're putting in and all of this information that you're developing when you passed it along to the anc were they appreciative did they say that this is exactly what they're looking for i mean what was your relationship with them at this point well it was extremely difficult to make contact it was very, very hard to pass on this information, but I did pass it on and it was received in the correct way. I mean, it was it was important information because it was absolute proof of what South Africa was doing in Namibia. It was what had been rumored in the press. And now we had the proof of it. It later turned out to be quite invaluable for SWAPO, and it also turned out to be of great interest to the Russians when I was debriefed by the Russians later on. Hmm. Okay, so you were debriefed in Africa then, I, I take I guess we're, we're jumping a little a bit ahead of course. We are but... jumping ahead a little bit, but eventually I was debriefed, but not by the ANC. I see, I see. Okay, so that brings me to my next question, as a matter of fact. So, of course, the the title of the book is Burned because you were burned eventually. So can you talk about how that happened? Like how did things fall apart for you eventually? I think I was a victim of my own success to some extent, and I don't mean that in an arrogant way at all. I was approached, and I don't still don't know by whom. I received a call while I was stationed in Vintook. I received a call inviting me to come to Pretoria for an interview in that I had been chosen as a candidate for the state president's office as a position as a media officer. 
And to get that close to F.W. de Klerk, who was the state president at the time, would have been an absolute victory for us. And I felt that it was something I had to go for. I absolutely could not avoid that at all. And I was aware of the fact that I would have to pass through security clearance. Now, I had done that before when I had joined the Broadcasting Corporation many years before. And also when I had joined the Bureau for Information, I had been called into security police headquarters for an interview, which was quite farcical. And eventually I was told I was fine and off I went. I'd passed the clearance. But in order to get to the state president's office, one had to go through the highest level of clearance. And I was aware of the fact that the ANC connection I had had all those years ago and the family connection through marriage might come out. Mm. And I knew it was a gamble. But so much of what I had done had been fortuitous. So much of it had been in the right place at the right time. Opportunities had just presented themselves and I'd flown with them and I'd gone with them and I'd, I'd flown by the seat of my pants off. And, but I'd got there and I'd got the information and I had actually managed to interview government ministers. My boss was a son of a government minister. I'd been to government ministers' houses. I'd moved in government circles. I'd done parliamentary duty. And if I hadn't taken those risks, I would never have done those things. And this was just another risk I had to take. So I went for it. And the worst happened. That particular check was the check that unraveled everything. And they found the connection. And I received a call, I think, the next day. Nobody identified themselves on the phone. They told me to stay exactly where I was. They said I would be accompanied back to Pretoria. And I realized the game was up and it was time to go. Mm. Okay. So they were trying to, they were not trying to cause you any alarm, but they had the opposite effect, I take it. I knew enough after working in government circles, what that meant. Ah, that okay. meant, don't move, we're coming to get you. <laughs> and if I was going down for an interview, either to Cape Town or to Pretoria, I would have gone down by myself on a plane. I certainly didn't need to be accompanied. And I realized then that I was speaking to somebody in the security services and they were coming to get me. Wow. And they didn't identify themselves and that was the call I'd been dreading. I didn't know how it would all end, but that's how it all started. That was the beginning of the end. So as you're hanging up on that phone call, I mean, do you already have a, a plan that's been in place for if you have to get out or did you have to come up with something immediately? I had no plan at all. I had no contact with Ronnie. I had no papers. I had no escape route. I had no money. I had nothing at all. And I put that phone down and my heart just sank. I remember sitting on the carpet, looking at the pattern on the carpet and thinking, well, what the hell do I do now? This is it. You know, it, it's over. And I thought, well, I've got to go. And I've got to go now. Because the sooner I go and the more time I can put between myself and them, the greater chance I've got of getting away. And that's what I did. I waited until the early hours of the morning and then I left the house where we'd all been staying and I made my way to the United Nations representatives who couldn't help me. Then I tried the fledgling Russian mission. There were two Russian representatives, but they were on their way to a cocktail party and they didn't want to get involved. So I was pretty horrified about that. But they did verify who I was. They sent a telex to Moscow and it was confirmed who I was. Yet they still left me. And in the end, I took a taxi to the airport and I tried to hire a car, but couldn't find a four wheel drive because to get out of Namibia, one has to go through desert territory. 
And I thought the next best bet is to make a beeline for Botswana, where there is a more established Soviet embassy, and hopefully they would be able to help me. And that was my plan. But unfortunately, there were no four wheel drives available, and the only thing I could do was hire a conventional car. And I realized I would have to drive from Namibia back into South Africa in order to get to Botswana. And I thought about it and thought, well, actually, it's probably not such a bad idea because they won't be expecting me to do that. I'll be in plain sight again. And that served me so well in all aspects of my life. And that's hmm. what I did. My gosh, so you just had to figure out everything on your own, on the fly. So were you? was your heart racing the entire time that you were making your way out? Oh, yes, it was. And also I had no map. I had no money, I had no papers, I had no escape route. There was nobody I could call. I had absolutely nothing. I was completely and utterly on my own. And I had never felt so alone in my life. My gosh. So how long was it before you felt safe again, once you were across the border out of the country or, or where exactly? I was probably, it took me about three days, I think to get from Namibia to Botswana. And that was continual driving. I drove all the time. I stopped at night because I had to, but I drove solidly. And the only time I was safe is when I was found by a representative of the Russian embassy in Botswana, who came and picked me up at Gaborone. I got into the capital of Gaborone. I was aware that I was under surveillance by then because there was a car following me. And I thought, right, they're going to intercept me at any point. And I managed to make my way to what was the Holiday Inn. And I hired a room, went upstairs, picked up a phone book and called the Russian embassy. And it was quite late in the afternoon. And to my surprise, somebody answered. And I spoke to them, I told them who I was, and he said, wait there, I'll be there in half an hour. And he was. And he picked me up and he took me to the Russian compound where I would have diplomatic immunity, nobody could touch me. And I was looked after there. I was seen by a nurse because by then I was absolutely exhausted, not feeling great at all. And I was debriefed there by the Russians over a hmm. period of a few days. And oh after a while, they put me on a plane to London, which also wasn't without its its frightening moments because it had to stop off in Johannesburg to pick up more, more people. And I was convinced they were going to board the plane and take me off, but they didn't. And eventually I made my way to the UK. And you just had to build a new life from scratch there. I mean, I guess you knew that you could not return back to South Africa anytime soon. Well, it absolutely exploded when I got to the UK. It was all over the press. The South Africans had made an absolute meal of it. It was full of disinformation. They interviewed my parents. They had harassed my parents, you know, filmed them, searched their house, taken photographs of me really unsettled all my friends and family, turned them upside down, really. And I was in London and I was safe. And the ANC issued a statement confirming who I was and what I was doing and that my contribution had been valuable. And I just went on with the rest of my life. I was debriefed by SWAPO. And the ANC gave me a pencil and a piece of paper and told me to write it down. And that was the last I ever heard of it. Huh. Wow. So the, the Russians did all this work to get you out of the country. And it seems yeah. like they took pretty good care of you. But SWAPO and the ANC, not so much, I take it? The SWAPO were very good to me. I met with some senior SWAPO leaders while I was in London. And over a period of a few days, we went through absolutely everything. And they were extremely kind and extremely respectful and appreciative. And my experience of the Russians were that they were incredibly sensitive and incredibly caring. 
at that point in time and they debriefed me thoroughly. And I haven't forgotten how all of that ended. It was mm. very difficult at that point. I can imagine, did that leave you, I, I, it sounds to me like you, you, you feel very bitter about that. I don't think I feel bitter. I, I no longer feel anything really. I hmm. think I feel probably aware of the fact that the ANC inadvertently ended up with an agent that infiltrated government departments more than they had expected me to do. That I had access to information that perhaps they didn't really know what to do with. And I have the feeling that perhaps it was all a learning process and a learning curve and they didn't quite know what to do with me. I think that's really how it all worked out in the end. It was a process of not quite knowing where I fitted in and probably being slightly surprised at the fact that I did what I did when I did and had access to the things that I had access to. Right. It's, it seems like you were a incredibly rare, incredibly valuable asset to them. And they, you were just totally underutilized from, from think, my read of your book. Anyway, they didn't know what they had, I think. And please, I, I don't want that to sound arrogant. It's not meant to be in any shape or form. I just think that it was a very unusual situation and because of a set of circumstances, uh, probably because of the legend I had, I was very ordinary. My strength was in my ordinariness. My whole presence was about being in plain sight. And that enabled me to get to all sorts of different places and in all sorts of different positions to meet all sorts of people and to have access to the information that I needed. And I think that it, it was just a very favorable set of circumstances yeah. and opportunities. And That's I was right. able to fly with it. Hmm. That's quite a story, quite a story, Sue. So you. in your in your new life in the UK in the years to come, do, to your knowledge, were you ever targeted by the South African government because I know that they were not afraid to send people outside of South Africa on these types of missions. They were not. And unfortunately, there was a, a series of assassinations and attacks on ANC people. And people were either murdered or very badly injured. People like Albie Sachs lost an arm and an eye, I think. Dulcy September was assassinated in her office. For instance, Ruth First was killed by a letter bomb. And unfortunately, there was a very active set of assassins and death squads who sought people like myself out. And I was warned that I was on a list. My post was intercepted. My mother at the time was quite oblivious to the danger of sending things through the post. And at the time, when I first got to the UK, I was I found out I was expecting a baby and my mother would send baby clothes through the post and these things would arrive and they would have been ripped to shreds and the parcel would have been opened and her letters would have been torn up. So it was a very clear message to me that I was still being watched and I was mm. still persona non grata. And mm. I think I have been for some years. Oh, even now you think that, I mean, I'm sure that there are some people that have not forgotten things, but oh, it has I think been people have long memories, you know, and mm. I'm very vigilant. I have not lost that. And I'm very conscious of the fact that I made enemies and I'm very conscious of the fact that I have been extremely fortunate to have lived a life in exile safely. And, you know, I, I value that. Yeah, I can, I can certainly understand how you would, no doubt about it. So as you look back, what do you think about the overall impact of your work? I mean, did you push things in one direction or another in a like a concrete and kind of measurable way? I mean, fear, you know, in your opinion? 
I think it's difficult to to judge on a personal level, but I do know that the information I gathered on Namibia was verified, and that was actually verified by Puk Borta himself. Some of the destabilization campaigns that we'd been involved in, the disinformation, that was all exposed, and I feel that I I paid a a valuable part in that. And also because what happened in Namibia was seen as a dry run as to how the South Africans planned to destabilize free and fair elections in South Africa when the time came and how they planned to discredit the ANC. So I think from that point of view, the Namibian work was very important and very valuable. And, you know, my part in the struggle is a very small part. There are people who have played a far greater role and who have made a far greater contribution. And I absolutely and totally respect them. And I'm I'm honored to have stood by them in the same struggle. And, you know, I, I say that with great humility. And I am so grateful for the opportunities that I had. And I felt that as I said at the beginning, it was a drop in the ocean, but it was my drop. And it took me a while to take ownership of that. And I feel now that I can speak freely about that. That's good. Yeah. And I'm so glad that we're, your story is out there because it is a, you know, a side of things that I did not know and that many people did not know. So it's really great to learn from your Thank perspective you. and about those events as they happen. Thank so, you. Sue, I know, of course, many, many things have changed in South Africa since that time. So what's your opinion on the current state of affairs in South Africa with the ruling party and with the standard of living and everything that's there now that has changed? How do, how do you feel about the progress that has been made? You know, for a, for some time after I came into exile in Europe, I felt that I I couldn't look at South Africa. I couldn't partake of it. I didn't want to be part of it. I, I felt that I needed to heal, I think, and to, to give myself time. And then I gradually became aware of developments in South Africa. And I was very saddened by reports of corruption and reports of crime. And I found that personally extremely upsetting, you know, for the ANC to go through the tumultuous time that I think it has been through with all the divisions within it, I, I find that very saddening. And I, I do understand too that we have to go through a process, that this is work in progress. The changes in South Africa are not over yet. They are merely a different phase, if you like. The struggle isn't over. The struggle continues. You know, we have a different format, perhaps, where we have to struggle against corruption or we have to struggle against some other things that might happen that we don't feel comfortable with. But it is still a process of learning. It is a process of development. And we have to embrace the fact that the struggle continues. Hmm. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Thank you so much, Sue. This has been really, really fascinating stuff, and I'm very glad that we had the opportunity to talk. For people who want to learn more about you, besides reading your book, is there anywhere that they can connect with you online? Do you have social media presence or website or anything like that at all? It's probably a good idea to 